Welcome to Shaky Sports Journeys. Thank you for joining us. Um, podcasts are coming thick and thin again. It's been nice to get back and get recording. Great guest for you today. Um, somebody I know very, very well. Uh, played a lot of cricket with on the field in Scotland as well as in Australia. Um, this gentleman has played for Winner Manly in Australia, has graced some turf in Scotland at Fergus Lee and Clydesdale Cricket Club, um, and went on to play a good five seasons for the Firebirds, first class cricket in New Zealand, as well as played a bit of cricket for Auckland as well. I'm talking about Dano, Dane Hutchison. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Shaggy. Yourself? Yeah, not bad, mate. Not bad. We had to do a bit of jiggy, jiggery pokery to get this in. Um, you know, you're a big difference in time sitting all the way over in Brisbane, Australia. How's things over there? Yeah, good, mate. Just coming into summer now. So it's obviously quite hot. Uh, we've had the floods this year again. And then, yeah, obviously, um, yeah, it's 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 getting it's getting that hot part of the year now. So sheltering and, uh, and keeping it nice and cool. I hope you've got some air conditioning in your place. Mate, I think everyone everyone here does, I think, in this part of the country. I think uh, it's a it's a staple and a necessity. If you don't, you're in a bit of strife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember my time in Brisbane. I lived in the air conditioning. I never wanted to leave my room, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to have a chat today, Dino. Talk through your, you know, your journey in life and in cricket. Um, you know, I've spent some time with you, as I mentioned, and uh, I'm keen to hear all about your story. But I want to take you kind of back to... Your roots, you know, I want to know where you're from. Tell me a bit more about your family, your background, and what your childhood was like. Yeah, well, it's, it's not a normal story, I suppose, you know, um, starting off being a, being born a triplet um, with two other brothers. So the middle child syndrome, I can guarantee, is still is still there, even though it's only one minute difference. Um, and I think, you know, there's a story going around from the old girl that um, we're all, Joel and Jason, my brothers, so we're all named throughout the first two weeks of our uh, of our birth. You know, there were, I was Jason, Joel was Dane, because it was all different. So we had to be color-coded. And, and um, I think it was red, green, and blue, just so they could figure out who, who was who. So, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that was, it was an interesting time, uh, being a triplet, born in 86. So a proud 80s baby. But, um, yeah, it was good, mate. Always had someone to play sport with. Um, and, yeah, so we, we moved to Wynnum when we were about, I think we were about five, I think. And um, where were, were you before point. that? Where, where, where were you born? Where, where, where were you before you moved to Wynnum? Oh, we were born in South Brisbane at the Mata. So we were just living in a, in a different suburb in Norman Park there. And, um, you know, it was just a, honestly, it was a one bedroom flat. Uh, Mum was over from New Zealand. She was young, 24 years old. Um, dad was working at Amart and, um, you know, making ends meet. So it was just, you know, three boys, mum and dad in a, in a one bedroom flat. Pretty humble beginnings, um, but it was always, it was always good. Um, so then we got the first family, the proper family home um, in South Brisbane at Grey Street. And then, so that's in Carina. And then we, we moved when we were about five years old. We needed to upgrade and get a bit of a yard. And we got flooding there. So we sort of had to had to skip out of there and, and move into the, the Bayside. So it was good. So five years old, you're in Brisbane now, South Brisbane, Wynnum. Um, what was it like? What was it like kind of going through your childhood, school, et cetera? Yeah, well... Yeah, as again, pretty tumultuous. So like, yeah, when we were in grade, I think we were in grade four or grade five, um, you know, we were three three boys, you know, quite, you know, quite highly strung, you know, cricket players, soccer players, and we're, you know, searching for our own identity, I suppose. And um, so mum and dad decided to put us into three different primary schools until grade seven. So, you know, in the morning, mum would take me up to Manly and then drop Joel off at Manly West and then drop Jason at Gundar. And then the afternoon, she'd do the opposite, go and pick him up and then Joel then me. So just to try and give us a bit of normality or a bit of, um, you know, there was no other triplets around, you know, so to give us a bit of their own space and our own friend group and everything, they went to extremes, but um, which was, you know, it was good. Um, and then in grade seven, we all went to uh, our own college. So we all went to the same. Um, we actually, we got baptised just to, just so mum was sure that we could get in. Uh, I can't just say it's against our will to be baptised, but it was a Christian college, so mum mum didn't want any uh, any risk, so she she made she made to get baptised at twelve, which is unusual. Um, and you know, um, I don't get burnt when I walk into churches, so that's okay. But yeah, um, we got into the school. Jason was running cross country for Queensland, playing cricket. I was playing cricket and soccer, and Joel was playing cricket and soccer, or mainly soccer for Joel. 
um, yeah, so it was it was an interesting first little period to that teenage, the teenage sort of um, part of our lives where things took a bit of a unusual turn. You know, it's not the normal story where you finish in grade twelve and then you go off to uni and and then you progress through what you're doing. It was a bit more of a, a different different sort of pathway. Well, your mom, your mom. I mean, I I do the school pickup or the nursery pickup now, and I've got one pickup to do. Um, three pickups, three drop offs. That couldn't have been easy. Um, you know, that's a big commitment to have to do every single day. Um, so fair play to your mum for doing that. Um, and I can yeah. kind of, you know, it's interesting to hear about triplets. Um, you wouldn't, I mean, I know a few twins, but uh, triplets is uh, is different. Um, I don't think you're the only triplets in the world. I'm sure there's a few out there. But it is interesting to hear you talk about finding your own identity. Uh, very interesting that your mum opted to send you to different primary schools. Um, mm. But... You know, I think it's uh, it's probably just been for your own character building, hasn't it? Just to kind of get you, get you ready for for life life ahead. Um, cricket. Then, when did you realise? What age were you when you started playing cricket and realising that there was something there? Yeah, really young. I mean, when we moved into Maxwell Place and Wyndham, like you know, Dad would come home from work and we had a, a perfect size backyard for mini backyard cricket. It was you know probably 12 foot long, anything on the floor was out, you know, over the fence was out. So it was really, really tough, but... You couldn't uh, have been very good at that then, Daniel. You weren't very good no, at... Mate, no, mate, no. Ne- <laughs> mate, my brother used to get double hundreds on uh, when the Ashes were on, and uh, he'd go in, we'd watch it till tea, and then I'd come back out. He'd nick me off first ball and go back inside. <laughs> uh, it's not much fun. I didn't get much time with the willow in the backyard, but, you know, we were about five or six, and, you know, Dad said to us, all three of us sat us down and said, OK, you've got to play a winter sport and a summer sport. Didn't tell us what sports we had to play, but just said, look, you've got to be active and we, we want you to be playing sport because it's, you know, it's, it's character building. It's good stuff. So we all chose soccer and cricket, uh, soccer for the winter and, and cricket for the summer. Um, I'm not sure why we did. I think we were watching a lot of soccer at the time and, you know, otherwise, and I think Jason played a little bit of league in grade seven when we got a bit older and the kids started giving you a bit of grief about playing soccer. So, yeah, we were young. And then I realised pretty quickly that um, I could bowl with some pace um you know my mum's a good athlete she was a 400 meter um champion runner and and dad was a long distance runner so we've got some decent stock in terms of fitness and ability um and sort of coordination but yeah pretty early on um playing in the park dad would mow turf wickets and we'd get out there against the neighbors kids and we'd just give it to them so yeah identify pretty early when we went to club cricket too so so then what was your kind of route into cricket then you mentioned club cricket was it Wenham to from early days yeah look um long time ago so look I think we started at Wyndham in juniors and we started in under fives you know and you go all the way through Kanga cricket and then you go under fives etc but I think for me cricket really started around the age of 14 where I was playing 13 A's at, at 13 and I was batting three and opened the bowling for Iona College in the AIC tournament and then I was 14 A's I was doing the same and then I got picked in the first 11 at 15 so it was a pretty rude awakening going from being a 15 year old now you're playing with the, as they say the grade 12ers and, you know, at school, you know, the guys in grade 12 when you're in grade 10, they seem like they're 30 and you're 15. So um, it was, yeah, it was it was a little bit daunting, but just um, give me one second. Can you cut the heck? I'm just going to get this dog. It's all good, mate. It's all good if you've got a dog. It's all good. What type yeah. of dog you got? Uh, he's just a moodle. So he's, uh, yeah, he's a lap dog, but he's, he's got, got, a bit of, got a bit about him. He's all right. But um, well, he's your yeah, dog. He's your dog. You must have a bit about him. He must be a yeah, character. he's good, mate. He's good. He, he gets puffed as, as, as quickly as me when we go for a run, so I like him. He, you know, he's been nice. <laughs> but yeah, no, look, um, it was around that 14 years of age where I was identified and played some some local rep stuff, Met East and, and that kind of thing. Um, never was involved in the Queensland Junior setup, but um, I could bowl fast. I had a bad action at the time, and I could just bowl fast, and and it was it was working. So then I went into the Wyndham setup. Jason and I, my brother, actually started in fifth grade at Wyndham when we were about 14 or 15. And we played fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade, second grade. So we went through all the grades before getting to that first grade. So that's not a normal pathway for young guys. You know, you're playing against seasoned vets who are disgruntled at, at 15, getting told every, called every name under the sun. And you just sort of, you, you cop it. And I mean, we were tough and rumble kids. So we sort of just gave it back as much as we got with our high pitched voices and, and got away with it at the time. It was a different era then. You know, there's no PC back then, Shaky. So it was. Yeah, yeah. Anything, played, anything, guys. Played, you can imagine playing. Yeah, I've, I've been over. I've played. We'll talk about it a bit later. But uh, yeah. I know what it's like. It's a tough school. 
I always found it really interesting that, um, you know, you had five nets at Wynnum um, and you had your first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and everybody, there was chirping going on between the nets almost because people wanted to get into the third grade net that were in the fourth or fifth grade net and they'd yeah. be chirping them. And it, 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 I, I, I always found it was uh, it was healthy enough. It was competitive. Um, never really crossed the line, which which I think is uh, which I think is important. Um, so when did you, you know, you, you you're making your way in, in club cricket? When did you really? I remember you telling me, Dano, about a time you went to um, bowl at the Aussies or something. What age would you have been around that time? I remember you telling me about your footwear and stuff, and it was like, I don't know, wasn't really suitable for fast bowling. Yeah, no. So like, I, I got I got identified at about six. Or, you know, I just turned sixteen, and um, you know, at the time I wasn't at school. You know, I was working in a bottle shop in Wynnum. Um, you know, I'd sort of been through a couple of schools, and I just yeah, I was off the rails a bit, you know. And I was it was you know it was I was living out of home. I was working, paying my own way at that sort of age, or maybe not sixteen. I think seventeen. But when I was sixteen, I was working a bottle and and doing that kind of thing and. And um, I got identified down at Wynnum. I uh, don't remember who it might have been, maybe Adam Dale or someone was down there. I'm not too sure. I can't, I don't want to name names, but they rang up the Queensland guy, Stephen Fryer, and they said, look, there's a guy we've got down here. He's young. He's got a shock in action, but he can bowl quick. So um, do you want to have a look at him? And they said, yeah, yeah, righto. Um, send him down to the Gabba. We've got a um, 17s and 19s squad training. We haven't picked the teams yet, but we've got like our invita invitational guys. You know, at the time, I'd say 95% of the kids there had been playing Queensland rep stuff with, with each other since they were young, 13, 14, 15. So, you know, you know, that age group is pretty brutal. They're all sort of together. That's where you feel comfortable with the people you know. And, um, you know, I rocked up and, and our house had just been broken into and um, I left the door open, you know, and I, I was, it was not a good day. Um, so, you know, um, I wasn't, I'll just say I wasn't in the best of Nick in terms of headspace yep. when I got there. Um, and I was wearing, you know, Billabong. I think I was wearing Billabong bloody um, boardies and some ratty shirt. But Dad just come and got me from a mate's place. Said, "Mate, you, you're not missing this. Come on, let's go." And um, I remember I was bowling, and this guy sort of just turned around. And this could be a bit of an embellishment, but I, I, this is what I remember. They sort of turned around and went, "Who, who, who is this guy? You know, we'd never seen him before, never heard about him." And then um, so then they sort of identified a bit of pace there. Um, I was too nervous for them to say anything. So I just nodded and did my thing. And um, I actually, I was gonna get some water about 40 minutes in the session and I twisted my ankle on one of the stairs and I was hobbling around through that for a bit. But yeah, that was when I first got identified and that's the, the I suppose the process that led me to play for Queensland under 17s. Um, I got identified, did some trial games and then we went away to Adelaide. So, you know, there's some good names in that team. There's a lot of first class cricketers, Ben Dunk was in that side. Um, Graham Skinner, who played first grade, uh, first class cricket for Queensland, he played a couple of games. Um, you know, Tony Gregg's nephew, Andrew was a captain. He was, you know, he was good value. Um, and there was a few others that, you know, slipped my mind at the moment, but really good side. And, and, and for me, it was a good experience, definitely a good experience. And that's when things sort of, that's when I sort of thought, okay, I can do something with this. And then I sort of tried to clean, clean the act up off the field a bit. So Queensland, what 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 kind of what's the tournament that you play in at under 17s? You go and play against all the other states. Yeah, so it's different now. But when it, when we were playing, it was um, you know Vic. I think ACT were in it. Vic, ACT, Tassie, New South Wales, WA, and we basically go all go to um, Adelaide for a couple of weeks and we play a bunch of one days. So there was no T20 cricket then. So it was all one day stuff. And I don't remember if we did play any two day stuff, but I think from memory it was all one day stuff. Yeah, so. Um, and then they pick like an Aussie squad or, or whatever, or some shadow players. And then, but back then, it, it doesn't have the the same structure as it does now. You know, it seems to be a World Cup every two years for Aussie nineteens and seventeens. Or, and I don't, I'm not sure how it is in Scotland, but there's a lot more money invested in cricket and a lot more, um, I suppose, structure around it uh, now. Yeah. So, and how did you go? How did you go at these tournaments? Well, there was only one tournament. I did okay. I did okay. Um, you know, I was smoking ciggies. So I was like, you know, at that age, it doesn't really affect you, but it's the it's the social thing that happens. Like if you get caught doing that, you're still 17, you're 16. Um, but that's just what we were doing, you know, me and my mates. And um, I think some of the coaches got wind. And, you know, it was one of those things like you can look back now and go, geez, you could have just taken a week off, mate, couldn't you? But, you know, at the time you just sort of, 
I think that's your coping mechanism. Just go into what you feel comfortable doing. So, so I mean, you think about it today um, with how, you know, I coach some kids now and stuff and you think 16, geez, you're smoking a few cigars and having drinks in the park and whatnot. You know I mean? You still look at it now. You don't see it happening too much or not on my radar anyway, but yeah, that's what we were doing. So, I mean, I, I personally, I went well in the tournament. I did okay. Um, and it was really good because, you know, it led into the cricket season for me. And that's when I got my, uh, my first first grade cat to win them at uh, I think it was about 17 when I got that. So yeah. interesting you mentioned winning them now at this point, first grade cricket. Obviously, I've had experience of um of being around it, being around the club. I mean, first grade cricket in Australia is probably, in my opinion, just as strong as some first class setups around other countries. Um that there's a lot less professional cricketers in Australia than there is in the likes of England. Um, mm. and, and and some other parts as well. What can, what was it like coming into that kind of changing room, that kind of environment? You know who was in that changing room when you came in. I know there's a there's a famous brothers. Um, oh, is it the pools? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you know the oldest brother in particular was a bit Justin, of a yeah. yeah, bit of a bit of a freak. Um, I, I played yeah. with both, played a bit of cricket with both other brothers as well. But were these the type of guys that were around the changing room when you came in? Yeah, so Justin's actually just come back. He's playing threes again. So he's had about 15 years off and now he's back. I think he was playing with his son in five, but he's just found out that he needs, I think he needs like um, 30 runs to be the club's leading run score, 11,000, you know, first grade, wow. grade runs for the club or something like that. So, you know, I walked in there and, and you know, I'd been around the club for a couple of years in that grade set up, playing twos, threes, fours. So guys knew me, but, you know, I was always, I don't know how to say it, but like, I was a bit of a mouthy little bastard, you know, like I, I had the accessories and I thought, I thought my shit didn't stink. And I, I just, I, I was a competitor, but I was just, I didn't, didn't have the peripheral. I didn't, I wasn't reading the play, you know, I was just a bit loud mouth and, and look back, I smile now, but you know, there was guys like um, Justin, Ryan Poole, uh, Ryan Broad, Chris Simpson, who captained Queensland for, you know, decade, um, you know, Craig Rosario, Troy Watts. I remember, you know, my first day in the park, you know, he's bowling. And he's bowled an off cutter, and you know they're they're beating us. You know it's day one, but they're sort of two for plenty. And he's I'm at mid off, and he's gone another one for Nutty as his nickname. And and me, it's my first ever chance at a catch in first grade, and I shit the bed and, and just hit, 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 hit me in the chest. And I remember he was not impressed whatsoever. I don't know if I can repeat what he said to me, but he wasn't really impressed. So, you know, my first ball I bowled I think to Craig Phillipson, and he hit me for six out of the cut into the car park, and that's a decent hit on Bill uh, Bill Aubrey Oval. So. Yeah, it was a rocky start. You know, it was, um, I think you think typical of how a 17-year-old 17, 17 year might go, you know, who's doesn't know the environment, doesn't know the landscape. It was, um, it was definitely a rocky start. But, you know, it was one of those things you go, at the time, you think, geez, I'm playing first grade cricket. There's only, what, probably 80, 90 blokes in Queensland or Brisbane turning up to play ones this week, and I'm one of them. So at the time, I was really proud of making that and getting my cap and, and obviously trying to contribute to the, to the team. Yeah, it was good. So Dano, what age were you when you came to Scotland and how did how did that come about? Because you came over the first time um to the lovely parts of Paisley, Scotland, to play for Fergusley. But tell me how the opportunity came about and remind me what age you were when you came over. I think I was 18, mate. Yeah, just maybe turning 19, 18. I think I was just 18, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was my first time overseas. Um, I think Benny had been over there, Ben Lockman had been over there playing. Um Maybe a season before that, or yeah, Ben had Oscar. Ben had Ben had played at Fergusley and Steno had played at Clydesdale. That was that's the year right. And since obviously Steen being a winning boy too, you know, he played with me in the first grade side as well. Um, and I think by memory, I think um, it was just, you know, the guys were talking around the place, and I was, I was keen to, to get away from what I was doing there, and and I didn't have anything holding me back. So I decided to to sort of inquire about you know, what, what opportunities there were going to be. Um, and yeah, so obviously Fergusley, I think, came back to me and a few others and, and we worked out worked out a situation and the next thing I know, I'm over there playing cricket. Yeah. So what was it like arriving? Did you come to Glasgow Airport? Yeah, yeah, straight to Glasgow. So we did the, I did the, uh, I think Singapore was first leg and then I went straight to Glasgow, which was, a, that's a long flight. That's like 18 hours straight. Um, I was in decent nick, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't look like a proper athlete, you know, I was a bit bulky and whatever else, but um, yeah, it was very nerve wracking, you know, like um, I think, 
that kind of environment, you sort of, everything, you look at your clothes, everything you want. For me personally, I wanted everything to be perfect when I first meet them. The handshake had to be perfect, you know, all that kind of stuff, because those little things I always thought mattered a lot, you know? So arriving, it was cold. It was a rude shock with the, with the weather, obviously being in Brisbane my whole life. So yeah, it was interesting. Who, do you remember who picked you up first time you arrived in Glasgow? Oh, geez, it must have been the president. Uh, was it one of the Murray boys or was it, um, who was the president at that time? All I, I do remember getting picked up and I remember getting taken straight to the flat and Harps was sitting there, David Harper, and he was sitting there. David Harper, the legend. Under, the legend, the man, the myth. He was sitting there in his pair of big white undies on the couch in his big Caribbean accent. G'day, young fella, how you doing? Yeah, good, mate, how you going? So it was, yeah, it was kind of cool. But, you know, it was also one of those things where you don't know where to sit. You know, you're young, you have, you know, you have, don't really know what to do. So a lot of other guys might see that now and sort of go, well, that's just normal. You just sort of be yourself. But back then, I think, I mean, you can attest to things were a little bit different. And there was a, there was a hierarchy, you know, I was the amateur, he was a pro, you know, there's, there is a hierarchy. And, and if anyone's been in a dressing room before, you know, you don't sit where the big dogs sit until you're a big dog. And then that's just how cricket is, you know? So, so who, yeah, it was, who, who would have been that team? I'm just thinking back because I would have played against you. Um, Raji Rautray. Yeah. Uh, Obi, Madge. Yeah. Stuart Murray was open the batting. Yeah. Um, Stuart, Nathan Kennedy, Adcock was, Stuart Kennedy would have still been playing. Rab. Stuart Kennedy, yeah. Stuart Kennedy was playing. Rabs, yeah, he was playing. Um, Nathan Adcock, I, was, I think he was playing. He was a pro. So, yeah, so he hard. was a pro. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah, he was. He went on to captain South Australia, but he was in replace of Con Long. And sadly, obviously, what happened with Con? That's a huge shock to the whole cricketing world. He was such a such a good um, such a good role model for people in that club, and, and not just that, but in Scottish cricket in general. You know, so just wanted to shout there, shout out there. But um, yeah, so Nathan came across, and um, who else would there have been? No, there, was a, there was a few. There was a few. We sort of chat. Good side, though. Eddie, good side. Yeah, it was good side. Nathan Adcock and, was a. Proper player as well, really good bat, both some tidy off spin. Yeah, he, yeah, he was a good player, and the wicket was conducive to what we had as well. I think um, it was it was really good if you got the ball first for the seamers. Um, if you bowled second, the spinners got a bit of turn, and so it was it was good. Sandy Strang, how could I forget the great man the Sandy late, Strang? The late Sandy Strang, um, cover, <laughs> cover. Yeah, I just loved it. So I've never seen any like it where a keeper. He was so brilliant with his chat and brilliant with the gloves, but. If you missed him by the box, hand goes up, cover, and the ball fly over and you shit back it up trying to figure out what's going yeah. on. So yeah, we lost him. Man. We lost him a couple of a couple of years ago now, and he's uh he's very, very, very missed. Um Sorry. as is uh, as is the late Conda Langer, who you who you mentioned as well. Both of them were were superb um servants to to Fergus Lee cricket and to Scottish cricket con in more recent times. Uh, before his passing, played a lot of years at Clydesdale, and I know from speaking to a lot of people there, he had a massive influence uh, uh, on everybody at the club as well. So you know, res pay their respects to both of them, and may they both rest easy, and, and all our love to their their families as well. Um, but yeah, you played in a very, a very, very good side. What was it like playing with Maggie and Omar? A couple of characters there. Brilliant. Those two guys. I'll tell you what, like they welcomed me with open arms. Um, I remember, I specifically remember using Madge's um, Ishan or Isan bat. Yeah. Um, he let me use it because, you know, my, I was, my bats were real good. So I, I sort of went, you know, this guy was smashing him. He just, he never looked like he was even trying. He just used to lean on the ball. And I remember saying to him one day, I said, mate, how do you do this? And he goes, I'll come down the nets with me on Tuesday or so and I'll show you. And he, he taught me just to time the ball. So just meet the ball at the right time. People think timing is X, Y, and Z, but it's just meeting the ball at the right time, at the optimal time to get that that full value. So he, he taught me that and said, you don't have to be overly aggressive. You can calm down a bit. You're the amateur over here. So you're going to get targeted by some of the umpires and some of the players. It's just na the nature of the business. So he was always a level head. Omi the same, awesome guys. So playing with them, it was, they showed me really like the, they were at the pinnacle of Scottish cricket at the time, weren't they? Really? Or they were coming into their, their best stages, weren't they? Yeah. Where absolutely. they were just, you know, really fit. Oh, Maggi, well, Omi was getting pretty fit, but the Maggi was working on his fitness. But also, just in terms of the way he played his cricket, it was just so good. His off spin when he bowled the 26 yarder, you know, I'd never seen some of this stuff before. So it was a massive eye opener. And, you know, we're still good mates today and we talk sometimes. And yeah, shout out to Imagine Omar. Great guys. 
And then what was your kind of, you, you were obviously younger, so who would you be mixing with around Fergusley at that point? Who was kind of your, who did you kick about with? Oh, um, it's hard to remember now, but I remember Andrew Stafford, he didn't play much cricket, but I, he lived across the way from me, so I hung out with him a little bit. Um, Andy McNeil was always, he was just an absolute character. He played a bit of first team. He, he loves his, gets his guitar out and plays music and stuff. So I, I gravitated towards him because he's a larrikin, you know, he was just, <clears throat> when you ran him, it was just 100% smiles all the time. So, so what did you do with yourself during the week? What I was working, um, I was working at Gilmore Sports. So um, I was doing a variety of things around there. So that was, um, um, I think, Stuart, is it Stuart Gilmore? I think he was yeah, the owner of yeah. Gilmore Sports. He also was the owner of St. Mirren Football Club. That's correct. So I was working there and, um, yeah, so a couple of times I snuck a little TV in and I was upstairs folding bibs for the, for the hockey guys. And um, the, I think the Ashes are on, or I think it was England, Australia, was playing something. And I was sitting up there and they found me asleep on top of a big pile of bibs with the, with the TV on my chest. You know, so I was, you know, it's, 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 hard. it's, it's funny you think about it now. You go, geez, you're a, you're a bit of a bit of a bastard. You know what I mean? Oh, you're a young um, lad, weren't you? You were a young lad. Um, a long way from home, taking in some new experiences. Um, and, and yeah, if you fell asleep on a bunch of bibs, um, you know, I don't think it's the, I don't think you'd be the first person to do that, something like that. I don't think you'd be the last person to do something like that. What was your, um, I always remember you telling me about your travel to work. What was, what was that like? Yeah, it was a funny lead in you bring in. So I, initially I was getting picked up. Um, and I mean, this, there's also things a little bit hazy as well. It's been a long time. So the way I remember it, mate, is, you know, I was getting picked up initially and then, and then there was an incident um, in the flat. So, um, and then from that incident moving forward, you know, um, I think Maggie dropped the bike over and he said, here you go, mate. You're on your bike, and I'm not sure the distance, and I haven't done it on Google Maps, but it's so Maggie it's gave good... you a, Maggie, Maggie gave you a bike. He dropped a bike over and said, "Mate, uh, well, I can't drop you because I've got stuff. Everyone's got stuff on, but mate, it's better than walking because the route that you're going to have to walk is a pretty dangerous part of town. So, you know, just get on the bike and go as hard as you can to get to work. So it was probably about a 30 minute bike ride. I'm not too sure if that's right, but it could pretty be good. Pretty so, good of them though to to give you a bike, Daniel. You know, that's uh, yeah. kind of shows the. Shows what kind of person he is that he was looking out for you there. Yeah, I did get there was a few times there I had my heart in my mouth and I got stopped up a few times by some of the local. What do you call them there? The Neds? The Neds, yeah. <laughs> is it Neds? Yeah, Neds. Bloody Neds, yeah. So they pulled me up and I had to, I had to depart with about 10 quid in my pack of, my pack of ciggy. So I wasn't I wasn't overly fond of it. So I quickly worked out the route which I could go where I wouldn't get any hassle. So it was okay. Um, so what, take, what, what are some of your greatest memories? On the on the field, and um, playing preparing. See what games? Any games come spring to mind that you just even one or two that you really remember? Yeah, I think um, we played against Grange at um, at that ground there where they play like some of the internationals, and just seeing the clubhouse and the viewing deck and and everything else. And then Grange at the time had a really good side. You know, um, I fondly remember playing against Sean. We were at at Harriet's. You know, he was young, tear away quick. He was always a nice guy. Good to have a beer with. Um, and there was one guy. Say, was a lot, to, a lot to say in the pitch, though. But it was all oh, fun, absolutely. All fun. Especially when mate, I was—I think he was my age, or was he a year younger than me? And I was, yeah, he'll be—he'll be, he'll be about—he'll be about probably kind of between our ages, I think. Maybe you, maybe he's slightly, slightly older. Than thirty-six you or something. Thirty-seven. So I'm thirty-six. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but there was a guy who was an Aussie player who played for Uddingston at the time as well. Um, he was a really good pro, overseas pro, and we got along really well. Um, I think Alex Day, one of my mates, or the guys from Aussie that I know or played with over in New Zealand as well, he played for Addington as the pro. Um, what, how could I forget this story? So I'm talking to Majid and Omar at training. They're like, oh, there's a guy, Yasser Arafat, you know, he's, he's rapid. I've never heard of this guy before. Like, he's rapid. I said, right out, boys. And I was, I was in the middle of the wicket on a Friday night and I didn't know that they were friends. I didn't know that Yasser was, you know, the borderline international cricketer. And I said, see the hospital up there, mate? I'm going to drop kick him first night into that hospital, into that car park. That's what I'm going to do. So you can tell him tonight if you speak to him, I'm going to drop kick him for six into that hospital. And like, oh, no, no, Dino. And, but I just I just didn't know. I thought they were just talking about one of their mates from a different club. I didn't Omi, know who he Omi, was. Omi, Omi clearly didn't know either because I, I, I was obviously playing in the opposition team that you're talking about. And I was yep. trying to warn him, that, by the way, this guy's, this guy's quick. Um, and Omar yep. was telling me as well, I've got him covered. So you were going to drop yep. him into the hospital Omar was going to deal with them. So what happened on the day, mate? 
So I think I've walked out at four. I'm not sure why I was back at four. It was, it was in the top order anyway, top six. And um, I, I just remember this vividly. Yasser is not an angry guy. For anyone that knows him, he's the, he's the nicest guy. He's always got a smile on his face. He's a competitor. He's at the top of his mark. And I've taken leg. And he's taken his mark back like seven or eight metres. Oh, shit. I'm in trouble here. The keeper's on the ring. And I'm thinking, and there's a wind, and it's like, it doesn't really. Fergus used to go across the ground. This day, I swear to God, the wind was up his bum. <laughs> and he's just steamed in, as you know, with his slinging action. And I didn't see it. And the next thing I know, my middle stump is almost impaled first slip. And I've just, I've just, I looked at Omi, oh, what happened, mate? And I'm walking off. He said, mate, I thought it was a full bunk. I didn't know what happened. It was just too quick and too good. And from that day onwards, or maybe not, but I learned to uh, pick my battles a bit, a bit more cleverly after that. I, I, listen, same day, same thing happened. Omar came out to bat. I remember it very well. I think I was at cover, and uh, the first ball hit him on the pad on the full, and it hit the pad, and the bat hadn't even moved. And the second one was a <laughs> was an in swing in Yorker, and off he went. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, you're talking about a guy who, by the way, by that point had played for Pakistan in a in an ODI. So we weren't talking about we're not talking about any old cricketer here. We all, I'm sure, know who Yasser Arafat is now. Went on to play pretty much every league in the world. Played for Pakistan yeah. World Cups. He was a, a guy that could hit ninety miles per hour off of it, a very short height, uh, um, and, and just was just was quick. Um, I remember, you know, bringing it. I, I, I remember. I can't remember the specific what day, but I remember my first run in with you as well, Daniel. Um, mm. I think you were coming round the wicket. Um, I didn't know you that well. You'd obviously built relations up with my Jane Omar. I'd heard about you a little bit. Heard you were a bit of a character, and you, yeah. you know, you started. You started mouthing at me after the first couple of balls, and I think we shared a couple of pleasantries um, on yeah. the on the cricket field. But it was all healthy, all competitive, um, and I I really I really enjoyed really enjoyed playing against you. Clearly, you had a bit about you, um, and you both good pace. Thanks, mate. Yeah, look, um, I think at that stage I was sort of growing out. I was getting to realise that if I was too much of an asshole, the umpires would go off me so I wouldn't get those 50 50 sometimes or you know it's just human nature and also I started to realize well maybe not at this stage but I did later on that cricket's a really small place you know so if as long as you keep it you know above board I mean like I'm not sure about you but as a batsman would you would you rather hear about your technique being poor or this happening or that happening rather than your body shape or you know you if, if someone's questioning your ability in terms of calling you out on things that you might already have issues with in terms of your batting, like, you know, your front leg's bending too much, your, your head's falling over. Those things creep into your mind, right? So I'm sure it was probably not till I got to about 24 when I started using those. I think it was all, all abuse up, up until then, but I kept it I kept it on the path. Um, and I, was, I think uh, I might have been the first one to probably come over and, and offer you a soft crank or something at the end of the game. So, you know. Um, no, I always thought, always, a, off the field, Daniel, always a, good, always a great lad. Never, you never carried it off the pitch. Always had fond memories of having some banter with you after the game. You mentioned an incident because, unfortunately, your reputation at Fergusley kind of ended not in a very nice way. And I think it's 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 a good opportunity for you to explain your side of events um, because there's been a lot of hearsay, um, a lot of rumours that flew around around that time. You were nicknamed... Mm. Um, around that time as well, as uh, you were known as 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 Dane the Flame, um, tell me Fitting. about what happened. Yeah, I mean, look, it's one of those things where I think being young and naive, I think a lot of alcohol was involved. We were drinking, playing cards, and look, as I said before, yeah, it's such a long time ago. But I mean, this is how I sort of remember things, and things are a bit hazy. Things happen pretty quick. But I remember we were playing cards and, um, you know, and people were saying, oh, can we, can we get some food or whatever else? And I remember Harp said to me, look, and like, obviously in, in Aussie, we don't cook things on like in chip pans or even like in pans full of oil. We just don't do it. So I didn't know the volatility of the situation. Harps was in bed. We were playing cards and, um, you know, we had a few drinks, probably a few too many. Someone's in my ear. Can we can we get some food? I said, mate, look, there's, there's stuff in the kitchen. I'm, you know, I'm 18. I'm like, I'm not your mum. You can make whatever you want. And I don't know who it was, but we put some chips on the on the pan, um, in the pan, and maybe a piece of chicken or something like that. And then everyone came back out playing cards. And I obviously didn't know the volatility of what could what could happen. It's, you know, I mean, I think in Scotland now, like 25 chip pan fires a day occur or something ridiculous. Um, so, you know, 
25 minutes go by and I'm not thinking anything of it. And then I just smell this smoke. And um, I sort of got up and got all the food. And I'm thinking it might just be in the oven or just be, you know. So I walked into the kitchen and, you know, this this sort of pot's on fire. I'm thinking, what, what, what do I do? And obviously you don't introduce oxygen, which I don't know, because I'm thinking first thing, there's a window about four feet that way. I'm going to throw this thing out the window because I was just panicked, you know, young. I was like, oh, this is a problem. This is a big, big problem. Um, and as I took the pan off the stove, um, you know, it just burst into flames and burnt me. I dropped it sort of next to the door and I'm next to the window. I had to run through that. And, and then, yeah, we just woke up, up and we got everyone out of the apartment. Um, I remember Andy McNeil going back for his guitar. I think he was there. I don't want to call him out if he wasn't, but someone went back with their guitar. And then we just knocked on everyone's doors on the way down and said, you better get out. There's a fire. We're not sure how, how bad it's going to be. And with, you know, with those doors too, you know, I didn't bring my keys. It was all in a rush. And um, it's a, it's a one-way lock. You know, you don't have to lock it when you leave. You just shut the door. So the fire had to kick the door in when they got there. And to be honest, mate, it's a regrettable event. Um, it's one that, you know, it can be taken out of context. I've tried to, and I, I, know, I know it costs the club money and whatnot, but I've tried to over the years try and find a way to tell the story to people who ask me in a, in a sort of a lighthearted way. So then it's not, I don't relive the trauma of that episode, you know. Um, I feel for the club having to go through that. And, and obviously Harps, mate, you know, hate him the most because the big fella had to eat out of a out of a, a little bar fridge for the next three months. That happened at the very start of my trip. So I think I was two games in, mate. I was, I've been in the country for about three or four weeks. And it's not just, it's not, not a great way to start your trip. You know? It's not a great, great thing to happen to anyone, let alone a young guy naive traveling overseas on his own. And, and for Harps to stick in there with me, mate, I'll, I'll give him... 100% credit that was brilliant you know he kept me company and kept me going same with Madge and Omar um, and a few others you know but it was just for me it was you know it was such a, a shocking thing to happen and, and you know a precursor to a few other things that have happened um, through alcohol in my life as well so you know it's just one of those things um, but yeah I was, I, it's not a fun moment that's for sure. Listen um, you know to anyone out there listening you know these things can happen as you said there was a group of lads and probably getting a bit carried away and you know accidents can happen sometimes thankfully nobody was seriously hurt that is the main thing nobody was that's seriously the key hurt. yeah um and you know i'm sure all all of those that were there um whoever may have been there will, will have learned from the experience but i i mean certainly i don't think anybody meant for it to happen um and yeah the main thing is nobody was was seriously hurt so you come to the end of your stint at fergus Lee, um, you head back to lovely Brisbane, uh, back to a bit of warm weather. Another season with with Wynnum, and then I remember getting news that Yasser was coming over again, and we are going to sign Dane Hutchison, which was quite controversial because what had happened to Fergus Lee and the fact that you know reputations had uh, you know been tarnished a little bit. Um, mm. I was surprised when Clay still opted for it, but I was certainly encouraging of it because I knew what you were capable of the pitch, um, on the pitch. I knew you were a good lad off the pitch, just a bit misunderstood. That's always the way I felt towards you, Dano. You know, a, bit, a little bit misunderstood. Um, and you came over to to join what was was then a very very strong Clydesdale team. What what was uh what was it like coming coming back over and coming to join Clydesdale? Were you nervous? Were you better off for having the experience you'd already had at Fergusley? Um, to be honest, I was nervous. I was really nervous. I didn't want to see anyone. Uh, I thought I was going to get attacked at the airport. <laughs> to be honest, um, and you know, a lot of the negative stuff that's said about me is in, is is fair. You know, um, and upon reflection, you know, at that age, I, I wasn't a well-behaved kid, um, and and I was a naive young guy, and. I had no support network at, uh, in, in, in that area. I was, you know, at home I obviously did, but, you know, going over there and, and I had social anxiety, you know, I was, I was always trying really hard to fit in, in places. And, and that led me to drink. And when I, sometimes when I drank, bad things happen. And, and that was, it's been a consistent thing throughout my life, that sort of story. Um, so two different, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know what I mean? So coming over, you know, I was excited about playing with guys like yourself. Yes. I'm glad I didn't have to face him, which was great. Um, you know, Kaz Farad um, was a great guy. Ross Lyons, you know, fantastic left arm off spinner. 
So, and there's, there's a few more, Colin Mitchell, you know. Uh, big Greg characters and his, like uh, big characters like Greg Williams and Rennie Keith would have still oh. been the team. Yeah, I mean, and it was it was fantastic because they had you guys had a mixture of really really good talented youth, um, a lot of Asian youth, which was great to see. Like they're very talented naturally, like yourself, etc. But just and to see what you guys have done with the game is fantastic. But then guys like Greg, with you know, he's played what 50, 100 games for Scotland, so he was there to try and you know teach me as well. And and, and obviously Yasser, I got to live with Yasser, and it was just like a dream. I was I thought I was in in Disneyland. I was like, well, I'm living with Yasser Arafat, just not. I said to my mates, when I told my mates over here, I said, I'm living with Yasser Arafat when I go over there. They said, who? I said, no, 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 not that one, mate. Come on. <laughs> so, so you know, and I, I showed them a few YouTube videos I've been bowling, and they're like, yeah, okay, okay. And there were stories going around Yasser running with a, a tire around his waist in the morning doing 20 laps. And and I thought, okay, this would be great. I'll get over here, get motivated, and get fit with this guy. And and look, living with him was fantastic. He was he was awesome. He was an awesome guy. How did you get on? You get, you get on quite well with Yasser? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, he, we talk cricket a lot. Uh, we talk everything in between. You know, he'd take me down to Sucky. Is it Sucky Hall Street? Or what's the main street in Clydesdale there where they had all the... Uh, Albert all the Drive, Pollock Shields. That's Pollock the one, Shields. mate, yeah. So he, he would go down there and he's treated like a god, you know, and I'd follow him around, this little boy, a little white guy, you know, and we go for dinners. And he and he would... And look, we rarely brought any money because there's just no need. But the, the food was fantastic. And I could ask him all these questions and he was just a really, really good guy to have around. Um, I remember he gave me the big room as soon as I got there. He goes, here, mate, you can have this. I'm sleeping on the floor out here. So he'd have his little little mattress, little tiny mattress, um, and he'd sleep on the floor. And, um, yeah, he's just it was just an awesome time with, with Yas. It was great. We played some good cricket that uh, on, on, the, on the, that uh, that first, first season. A um, lot of good moments. I remember us losing a game against Grange at Grange, where I think we got about 280 or something, 290 mm. maybe. Um, and they chased it. Um, I, I mean, th there were some really good teams going around back then. I mean, they had a powerhouse batting lineup as well. Um, and they chased it down against our attack, which was a quality attack. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we had a really we had a really good attack. Um I just remember, you know, with Yasser, I remember him bowling and, and, and you know, he'd get one or two at the top out. And sometimes he wouldn't, but he'd always, always get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Because typically at that time in Scottish cricket, between, I think, maybe eight and 11, you'd probably find that those guys were struggling to even see that ball, let alone. And it, it was sometimes it was a bit dangerous, but we had a great attack. Um, Rossi was obviously doing his thing at one end. I think he was going for twos. And to score 280 in a, in a one-day game, um, you know, we're talking circa 2006, yeah. 2007, maybe. Yeah, you know, that's unheard of. You know, it's a 200 to winning score. It was a 220 is above par. So, you know, we did have a good side and it was, a, it was a memorable season. It was really good fun. But, you know, it wasn't our, I don't think it was our six, most successful season. We had a few tough losses there. But I do remember scoring 50 against Fergusley at Fergusley and, um, and walking off and didn't, I didn't get, it was just, you could, you could hear a pin drop. Not a single person was clapping. So that was, I was proud of that because I thought, no, this is a tough thing to do. Come back here, you know, you share showers with the blokes. But you come back here and I walked out the bat and, you know, there was a big crowd that day because the Clydesdale Ferguson game is a big game. And um, yeah, I think I batted with you for a fair bit there as well. And it was just good fun. Um, and yeah, that's one of the fond memories I, I have of, of that sort of, that era. So and at Clydesdale, you were actually getting on pretty well in my in my memory. You got on with there was good young core of young guys kicked around with us, and you know we had some some good times. Um, things kind of changed a little bit for you. Um, ben Lachlan came over, I think, to replace Yasser because Yasser had some international duty. Um, yeah. And Benny came over, and I think it was safe to say. Benny didn't particularly see eye to eye with you. Where do you think that came from? I think it was vice versa. I think, um, look, to be honest with you, um, I've thought about this a lot over the years. Um, you now, we were two guys playing for Wyndham at the time. We've got a, I wouldn't say a similar personality, but we've got a similar, fo a similar fire um, and a bit of a controversial streak, you know? Um, so I think we just had butted heads from the get go because of just because of that, you know, I'm, and, and I, I put my hand up and take responsibility for some of it. And I'm sure Benny does too. 
Um, you know, I probably wasn't a good flatmate. I was surprised because Yasser was never complained or anything like that. So, and I tried to be as hospitable as possible, but obviously there was something there that was just, um, you know, when you, you know, two blokes, two half males, you know, going at it, you know, so, sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, and there was an altercation and, um, and it was Benny had been at the club before. So, you know, a lot of the guys, and he's, he, man, he's a good guy. Like people get along with him. He's a really, he is a good guy, but I've never had the chance to really get to know him. So I think we just clashed and we made a decision from the get-go that was, it wasn't going to work. I remember when Colin told me he was coming, I was, I sort of said, look, we've got a bit of history. You know, we won a second grade flag the year before or something. And we had a bit of a blue about something, you know, before we went out and, you know, I, I think we're just from different places, you know, um, and that really changed everything for Mick Fosdale, but also, you know, I wasn't really being, um, I suppose, responsible, you know, I was, playing the puggy, I was smoking durries, and I, I wasn't really, I don't think I was really setting a good example at all. I wasn't thinking about being an example. I was just thinking about being the overseas amateur. I wasn't thinking about uh, what people, other people were looking in. I was just trying to survive doing what I was doing. Um, and, and you know, with that social anxiety and everything else, I was probably going a bit too far over the top. And, um, you know, I did ruffle a few feathers there. And, um, and I deeply regret some of the things that happened but at the same time, they've been learning experiences for me. Um, you know, I always think about how, how I would go about that um, if a young fella came over here. But as you know, it's a lot different here. Um, it's a big, bigger space. Everyone doesn't, you know, after the game, the boys have a beer and then go home. There's no real community. You know what I mean? There is a little community, but not really. Some of the boys might go out for a few beers, but it's not like you go into the village after you've gone out, you know, after you've played cricket. So, Yeah. I mean, I put my hand up and did take responsibility for, for a lot of the things that did happen. Um, but, and I can't just put it down to being young and stupid, you know, but it wasn't definitely premeditated and it wasn't, it wasn't like that. So it's just, as you said, probably a bit misunderstood. And I think I was suffering a bit with the lack of, you know, family around me, it's kind of thing. And it was just because of what happened at Ferguson, everything was just really, I suppose it was just like a t turmoil everywhere I looked and then Benny come over and then we had a blue and then, those guys wouldn't talk to me. And I'm like, why aren't they talking to me? And these guys would. And then, you know, then I started hanging out with um, Giuseppe Sanino. He was a good kid who lived along the way, played hockey. And he'd you know, go over his place and we'd play a PlayStation and we'd go out for drinks. And he was he was a great lad. And I was like, well, why aren't these guys like me? And I was focusing a lot on that rather than just playing cricket and just going whatever. But I think by then the damage had been done. So, yeah. Look, I can relate to you. I can relate to you because we're going to come over, we're going to come come on to talk about my experience of going the other direction um, and and spending more time with you. Uh, but it's interesting what you say. I always felt like you tried really hard, tried probably harder than you you needed to to try, just to to, to want you wanted you know you're a. I say it again, you're quite a misunderstood lad. I've always got on very well with you. You got a big heart. You're a lovable guy. You got a bit to say from time to time. I share a bit of that with you in my in my in my, in my youth as well. Um, and I think people maybe did bang heads heads with you a little bit. I mean, my relationship with Ben Laughlin didn't start well. We all, we had a massive run in when he first joined Clydesdale. Um, I didn't particularly like him. I went on to become good friends with the guy. He was brilliant to me when I came over to to Brisbane. Had him on the podcast not so long ago. And I think mm. between you two. It just seemed to, he just, he seemed to have something towards you that he, maybe you rubbed him up the wrong way. Um, I don't think you meant to. So if you're listening, Benny, you know, life's too short. You know, Dano doesn't certainly hold anything um, to, to, towards you. Um, and, and I personally think you're both great guys who uh, who played the game in a, in a really competitive way. Um, and you were never shy of a, of a word or two. Um, but off the field, I always found you, found you great blokes. And it was actually Benny who came to me at the end of would have been your last season and said, why don't you come over? Um, and it, the goal was to play first grade cricket. Why don't you come over mm. and play first grade cricket at Wynnum? Um, so I was going to be spending a lot more time with three people that I know very well. Steen Carlson, who was amateur at, at Clydesdale, good friend, yourself, right there, yeah. and Ben Laughlin. So I, I, can, I remember coming over to Australia um, and just coming into that environment where I was like, what, one boy, Asian lad, Scottish Asian. I'll still never forget it. Um, where uh, Neville, the coach, 
a lovely guy, just a little bit maybe uneducated at the time, introduced me to the whole club as, um, g'day boys, we've, uh, it's, uh, it's shaky, <laughs> sign a Scottish keyword, um, and Benny had to kind of just go over and say, you know, Neville, you don't say that, that's, uh, that's, that's not appropriate, but that's because the likes of Benny, yourself, and Steen had spent time over in Scotland and understood. Yeah. Um, I, I find in Australia it was still a little bit behind. People didn't really get that that was a that, that was a racial racial slur. Um, mm. but I know at the time it wasn't said like that, and Neville learned from yeah. the experience, and, and we moved on. But I mean, coming into that environment, you mentioned the guy. What was it, Troy Watts? Troy Watts, Nutty, yeah, Nutty. <clears throat> he was Nutty, horrible yeah. to me for the first yeah. month. He was yeah. coming so hard at me. I was just couldn't understand why does this guy not like me? Um, I look mm. back now, it was like a tough school, wasn't it? It was like, you're going to have to yeah. learn the hard way. My first net session, Craig Rosario nipped me off, first ball under lights with that pink ball. Mm. And I got told mm. I had to go out and run six fours, five fives, four fours, three threes, two twos, and a one two, in my pants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I had to wait a full week. <clears throat> to bat again and I was I couldn't I, I I was determined the following week but I was a tough net I was facing you Benny Rosario you know, Stino as well winging them winging them down yeah. with that bent that bent wrist a little bit um <laughs> <laughs> but, and Troy and then Troy Watts coming in bowling a bumper at you every second ball so like every second ball but, <laughs> the thing is but that net it was coming on so it was coming from from dusk into nighttime and the lights were just kicking in. So you don't really know what's going on, right? So you're sort of like uh, in the, using white and pink balls. There's no, there's no backing, you know what I mean? So, hey, come here. So, you know, and then, sorry, right, I'll mate. just grab you. Right. Yeah. Mate, this is only six months old, so you know. Hey, it's enough. It's so good. yeah, so I, I just remember it was it was really difficult because like you know you've got these guys and the balls are doing everything, and you don't you, you never know whether they're going to be in your half or not. So yeah, it's tough tough apprenticeship, definitely. So I mean that season, I played pretty much. I didn't end up making the first grade team. Um, you were a bit out of favour at when I'm at that point as well. So you were opening the bowling for the second grade team. Um, but we had a great bunch of guys. I had a great memory. Um, one guy comes to mind in particular who opened the ball and were you? Tim Evans, Dolph. What a great Dolph. guy he was. He's a legend. I've known Dolph pretty much my whole life. So, well, from at least, you know, under 13s, you know, we we get along really well. Um, do you want to tell the viewers what Dolph means? No, <laughs> don't actually know. You can tell oh, Okay, so... Um, well, he, he was nicknamed, I'm not sure the reason behind it, but it's a bit, not very PC, but he was nicknamed Adolf because he was oh, the, worst really? bloke on the, the worst bloke on the cricket field. So, but well, I think, I think that's wrong. I think he's a great fella, but, um, and he sweated profusely, but yeah, he's a great fella. And also Rowan Albury, I think he would have played with Wubby. Yeah. You know, so he's the son of the famous Bill Albury, who's the name, the Oval's named after it, went in there. You know, he'd run in all day, 30, 40 overs, and just bend his back. Yeah. Um, and Braden Teese, the box head. On leg spin, yeah. So you know, we we had a really really good side, really good side. I remember, I remember one day uh, we had a club sprint. Do you remember that, Daniel? I All do. Yeah. Seventy of us, sixty or seventy of us on the turf, and I remember everyone used to tell me that I was slow, and uh, he was all chased. He was all chased my tail that day. I beat all seventy. Yeah. Of us and nobody. Could. We didn't see it, mate. We didn't see it coming. You just took off. I think you got the head start like in Seinfeld with the you know the. The bloody car backfires and Jerry's off, you know. So I think you got the head start. But do you remember us all doing the um the the club sit ups? We'd you'd link arms on one side, so you'd, we'd all line up this way. So thirty five blokes and then thirty five blokes there, and you'd link your legs and link the guy next to his arms, and you'd just be going up and doing oh, the sit ups. Man. And we'd do thirty of them, and never would just kill us after training for no reason. Yeah. It was isn't unreal. But look, um, mate, yeah, I mean, from coming from Scottish cricket. And that the culture as well in Scotland is a lot different to Australia, isn't it? You know, um, and not just in cricket, but in everything in general. Um, yeah. Especially Clydesdale, where you've got a lot of um, multiculturalism, I suppose, and it's been there for a long time. Whereas Brisbane, Australia, at that time, not so much. So, you know, that would have been an interesting time for you. But yeah, did you enjoy it? 
Yeah, no, I loved it. I loved it. And you guys you got a hundred though. I remember you got. Did you get one or two tons? I got one hundred in the semi final, or the um, yeah. I got hundred in the semi. Yeah, uh, um, and unfortunately, we lost the final. We had them like nine down. They got it like nine. They were nine down. You were bowling at the end. We needed one wicket, and they they just got over the line. Yeah, I remember that. We're playing against Sunny Coast on the backfield, weren't we? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, we got, we got. I think, uh, the Sunny Coast. I think there was a couple of good players in. I think I, I might have bowled twenty something over straight that day. Unbelievable! You bowled some incredible spells. The club was there, and I think I remember. And this is not through alcohol, but I remember walking back because it was, you know, two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon. I've been bowling for three hours, and I walked to the top of my mark, and I just started throwing up. Then I turn around and run back and bowl. And I remember the guys in the hill. I, remember I, that. I, was in, I, remember I was in the best of shape. But the Sunny Coast guys are up on the hill and they're sitting in a guys like Nick Fitzpatrick, who I'll shout out to. He's a he's a good mate of mine now, and we had some good battles. They're sitting there and going, Oh, go on, Hacho, give him another pie and some some coke. Not diet coke, he's fat. So just stuff like that, you know, and it just kept you, it spurred you on. But it was, mate, it was one of the hottest days on record. It was like 43 degrees. I don't know how you survived. I you, you, would, you never played you would never play cricket in that before. No, no. Well, you never, you would never have played cricket in 14, 15 degrees um, in April in Scotland. So it's kind of similar where you probably couldn't feel your hands. Whereas I was just, I felt like I was in a sauna 24 hours, seven days a week. Mate, I remember you in Scotland. I remember after training, you'd stand at one side of Clydesdale and you'd hit the highest. You'd just throw them up and you'd whack these things. And we're standing there on the other end of the wicket. Like you'd, you'd hit them the whole width of the length of the field. And there's all of us there. We couldn't leave until we caught one. Yeah, and these things were coming down with ice on it, mate. And you just you walk off, you've got blueies all through here, all through here. Oh, mate, it was just a nightmare. But you know, I you didn't hit them. As, I, I couldn't hit them as high as the one that could hit them really high was Ross Lyons. He used to smoke yeah. some really high catches, and uh, yeah, it wasn't very fun. good hand speed. Eh? He had fast hands, really fast. Oh yeah, hands. yeah, yeah. Hits a hits a hits a clean ball. He's probably the biggest hitter that uh, that was around at Clydesdale at that point. Obviously, Greg could hit could hit big, but yeah, Ross could hit a pre- a fairly high ball. Um, but yeah, look, Australia was great. Your hospitality, you would come off and take me out, take me around, show me about. Benny was great. I would go and spend, Benny and Steen used to, to live together at that point, so I would go and spend quite a bit of time with them. But I loved the experience of playing in, in Brisbane. Uh, met some great lads, and I really enjoyed playing with uh, with yourself. Dolph, as we mentioned. Um, Husey, I used to open the back with a guy called Husey. He was a good lad. Chris Hughes, mate. Yeah, yeah that's Chris Hughes. Lovely guy. Lovely guy. Ken Pack's 400 meter runner. He's the fittest man on the planet, but also one of the best. He's a great, great and man. And then there was other good players, like they eventually went in the first game. Jason Singh. He was a good Yeah, Singy. Yep. Yeah. And there was another left-handed batsman who eventually went into the first team. He was really quality left-hand bat. Uh, what was it? Lefty. Um, well, there was a guy, Sandcrab, that was Troy Watts' brother. So he was the older brother of the Watts. So... There was there was obviously Troy, then there was Sandcrab, who played first grade and was sort of switching between the two, but played a lot of years at first grade. And then, and Nathan, then there was Brett. Nathan, what was it, Nathan? He batted number four. Was he a lefty? No, he was a right-handed batsman. Nathan Rabnot. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit, but good character, Mouthy. Loved yeah. the chat yeah. on the pitch. Loved it. Well, he went on to captain win him and score thousands and thousands of runs. Oh, really? Like he's, he's prolific. He, he's prolific, one of the most prolific run scorers in in great cricket over the last 10 years, if not probably the most. He's he just dominated attacks and he'd do it at a good clip. And he did it in first grade, he captain first grade. I think he was the club coach at some stage as well for Wynnum. He was the groundsman there. I think he lived in the shed behind the behind the nets. No, but he's a great guy, Nath. Um and yeah, he's he turned into a really, really good cricketer. Really and good before cricketer. we go on, I need to give definitely a shout out to a great, great guy that I met when I was at Wynnum. That was my captain, your captain as well. Mappus, what Mappus. a champion, what a champion individual. He was perfect for that team. You know, there's a lot of feisty characters, young talent coming in, loved playing under his leadership. He was brilliant as a captain. He must have had a good influence. Yeah, he was as well. fantastic, fantastic captain, fantastic cricketer. He's, you know, he's been a servant of the game for, you know, 30 plus years now in a leadership role of that club. I'm not sure of 30, but he's not that old, but, you know, more than two two decades. Um you definitely want to have three gullies to him, though, because he can score. doesn't matter what, what, what level of cricket he's playing. He can score 100 through just groveling, just eh, groveling through that, that gully region. So, yeah, no, he's fantastic. He's been great. He's still involved in the club the because there's a young kid that I know that's been over in Scotland playing. I don't know if you've come across him, Dano. Ali Nasser. 
I've, I've definitely heard of him play. Yeah, I've, I've seen. What club does he play for in Scotland? He's at Wenham. But no, what, what club is he? Oh, Ali Nasser. Is he at Wenham this year? He, he played. No, he's played at Wenham for the last couple of years. He came over and he played for Kelburn last year okay. at Scotland. But um, right. he's he's he, uh, he's he's at Wenham and he's made the first grade team. So, okay, yeah. Young kid. I can check the score. I normally check the scores. What do I normally check the scores on a on a Wednesday? So it gives me something to do. But yeah, I haven't I haven't heard of him or seen him around yet. But I'm I'm a bit far removed from the game now in, in terms of the great scene. I just watch from afar. Um, okay. haven't really got much to do with it, so I just like to watch on my cricket and stuff like that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so Dano, at this stage, I remember leaving Australia, and I always used to just think this guy, Dane Hutchison, man, he's like he's a quality cricketer, he can bowl fast, he can whack it, he can do pretty much everything. He's a bit of a character off the pitch, probably doesn't you know tick all the boxes. That you know the likes of Queensland and etc are looking for, and you mentioned it earlier on. You know you got caught smoking some ciggies when you were younger, and they kind of write you off after that. And then a couple of years passed, and I just see you. You've made your way over to New Zealand, and you're mm. playing bloody first class cricket in New Zealand. And I was I was so happy to see it because you've always, in my opinion, had the ability to be playing cricket at the top of top of your top level. But how did that? How did the opportunity come about? Yeah, thanks for the compliment, Kaz. Um, you know, I, I think I burned a lot of bridges in Queensland with with sort of my behaviour as a youth, but also, um, you know, I don't think I got blacklisted. I have to give Stephen Fryer and Darren Darren Holder and Tweet Byron a lot of credit. They they remachined my action from something that was giving me stress fractures, but I could bowl fast, into something that was re- really nice. Um, so you know, it was, and they spent a lot of time and and, and effort doing that. Um. But yeah, so how it sort of came about, and, and Queensland as well, they, they, you know, they had bowlers for, for days at the time. You know, I was performing quite, quite well um, in terms of what I was doing for Norse at the time in Brisbane. Um, I got a first grade hat trick the year before, and, and things were going well. Going on well. I was averaging like 19s probably with the ball. Um, and we weren't being very successful as a club, but you know, I was definitely asking the right questions. But I wasn't wasn't getting really any traction, and 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 that was fair enough because there were so many good players in front of me. You know, it was just ridiculous. They could have played three first class teams with the bowlers they had. So Nick Fitzpatrick was running the nets uh, at the Gabba, the bowl to the uh, to the Kiwis, and you know whoever would come over. So India, Australia would, would be there before a test match at the Gabba, and he was in charge at the time of, of organising net bowlers. So you know he said, "Oh Hacho, can you you know can you get a couple of mates together as well? We need you know we need four or five guys." to bowl the Kiwis before the test at the Gabba. And so, you know, my mates, I just sort of, do you want to go bowl the Kiwis? And the, they went and bought new boots the next morning, you know, to, to, to rock up in new boots. So, and, and they were good, you know, and it was good, but we got down there and and Fitzy being my mate, he was around the nets. I think he was working for QC at the time. Gives me a brand new cooker, you know, and I'm stretching, I'm ready to go. I'm thinking, you know, and me being an egotistical guy at the time, I was, Ego driven, I had to be the best at everything, I had to be the fastest. I got a better story than you. So it's just funny to look back, but then yeah, so I was running in the bowl and I was bowling huge noes, like you know, they most guys doing the nets. And I was bowling to a few players and bowled to Ross, bumped a few guys, which is probably an unspoken rule. You don't bump, you don't come in and bowl noes and bump test cricket is two days before a test match. But I made my own rules, I suppose. Um, but Damien Wright was the the bowling coach. I think he played for Victoria for a lot of years and he was a New Zealand bowling coach and me being the guy I am, you know, I, was, I wanted to see where I was because my mum's a Kiwi. So, and I had a New Zealand passport. So I thought, you know, I never thought about it before, but I was kind of mixing it up with these guys and getting it to chain back in and then one to hold. And it was going all right. I wasn't getting pumped. So I said, I said to Righty, I said, mate, look, um, my mum's a Kiwi. This is how I remember it also. Righty might have a different version of events. But I said, mate, mum's a Kiwi. Um, I'm playing first grade here for, for Norse and, you know, I'm keen to see what opportunities there are in New Zealand, if any. And what do you think? And he said, sure, mate. Look, I'll have a chat to the boys. And and from my memory, you know, a few of the guys are watching. And I was invited to have a fielding session with them afterwards. And we did some fielding at the Gabba. And then um, I think it was Dan Vittori said to me, he goes, oh, do you want to come to, we're playing at Alan Border tomorrow. So it might have been a week before the test. They're playing at Alan Border tomorrow against, I think, a President's Eleven, And we're going to be having a hit up the top while, while, while our guys are batting. Can you come and have a bowl to me tomorrow up here? 
And the top wicket at Allen Border is notorious of being rapid. I thought, you beauty, if the winds are right, I'm, I'm going to be all right here. And I just had a good day. I rocked up there and it was great of them to offer. And I had a good day and I bowled pretty quick. And and I wasn't, you know, it was midweek, I think. So I wasn't like I was just coming off a big spell on the weekend or anything. And uh, and I had a bit, you know, that adrenaline rush. So I think I was really, I wasn't, I was getting into my work. And um, from there, it kind of just evolved, you know. So kind of a unique situation. It's not your, your traditional, your you know, you're not your traditional way into a first class setup, but it was, you know, some might say it's a, a shortcut, but you know, for me it was a long way around because <laughs> I had to change country. So yeah. So then did the did, did, did the offer just come? The Firebirds over in New Zealand? No, so no, I, I played a game for Canterbury A about three months later against Otago in in so we, I flew into Canterbury, Roddy picked me up and dropped me at this at university. Uh, there's a university in Canterbury there. I met the boys the next day, you know, Tom Latham and Matt Henry were on the bus. They're only like 18 years old at the time, you know. And I was what? Well, I think I was 23, 24 at this stage. And we we drove to Dunedin from Canterbury, which, you know, Canterbury was once, uh, sorry, Dunedin was once referred to by the Rolling Stones as the tombstone of the world. So it was definitely a, you know, it was like a little Scottish town. It really was, but I'm not saying sort of like tombstone. I've played there. Like, I've played at Dunedin. Yeah. I've played at Carisbrook on the 19 World Cup. So I know it. I know the place. It's it's it for cricket. It's it's pretty grim, isn't it? You know, in terms of yeah. playing there. The, I mean, the the place is beautiful, the landscape's beautiful, but for cricket, when you're from Brisbane, it's a different kettle of fish. But and that went okay. Um, you know, I got three for in the thirty, I think, um, in the game. But you know, I got carried away on the on the drink one night uh, out of the four nights and just didn't look good. So there was no opportunity there. Um, and I didn't realise at the time how competitive first class cricket really was. I thought, you know, this guy plays first grade in Brisbane, he's going to rock up and. You know, he's going to get three for and they're going to give him a spot. It's like, mate, you got rocks in your head. So I went away um, and then I sort of started probing again about six months later. And Jamie Siddons, who's a great man, he was the coach of the Firebirds at the time. He just left Bangladesh and coaching their national men's side where he's back doing now. And he was coaching the Firebirds. And with some of the footage I had from North, with someone had been, it wasn't the day of the pooch yet, but it was, you know, the static camera, but someone was down there recording at North, his name, uh, Bartlett, he's a great man. And he sent me all the footage and then we put some YouTube videos up. And then I sent the footage to Jamie and he sort of liked the look of what he saw. And I was still that chest out kind of in your face kind of guy. And typically not how they really play cricket in New Zealand is that aggressive over the top sort of stuff. And I think Jamie saw a bit of spark there. He liked, he liked the look of my bowling, bringing the ball back into the right hander. A lot of guys, you know, as you know, righties, they always take the ball away. Most of the time have the one that goes a little bit or straight. So I was taking it back in for the wider point of difference. So we had a coffee in Brisbane and then um, I went over to New Zealand. I flew over, stayed with Robbie Kerr. So obviously Amelia plays for the Black Caps and Brisbane Brisbane Heat in the WBBL, et cetera. She's a fantastic cricketer. And um, I did a fitness test, which I failed miserably. Like it was just embarrassing. You know, you know, like a yo-yo on a, on a um, doing a yo-yo test on a treadmill. And yep. I, I prepared for this. I prepared for this for two months. I'd lost like six kilos, you know, and I failed all the tests, you know, and but I bowled really well and I batted well. So I thought, okay, well, we can work with this, but we're not prepared to give him a contract. We'll get him a club. If the club can subsidize some of it, you know, whatever. And then he can train with us full time. And if he if he gets a you know, if he gets a chance, so he can be part of the squad, but he's not contracted. So that was my first year. How did that go then? You, you was that about a bit of a wake up call that you had to get your, your, your yourself in a in a good place, get the head screwed on if you'd really want to go on and play first class cricket. To me, I don't think you went on to then play five six seasons of first class cricket for no reason. Was that a bit of a turning point in your cricket career that you maybe had to make some decisions about how you went about things? Yeah, or no, I mean, or, no, or no, you just, you just <laughs> well, to, to a degree, yes. Um, and also, there was still the you know, the underlying issues with alcohol, you know. So, there was there was the and then you know, there was the the realization that I had to I had to get a pass mark in, in the fitness degree in the, in the fitness term. So, like, you, you with the fitness testing and the, and the strength testing, you just don't fail, like, you can't fail, they won't let you fail. You've got to get there or you don't play pretty much in, in most in most situations. Um, it's just a wildly, you know, it's, mate, you've got to make this mark. This is our base, baseline mark. So I went back to Brizzy and I got ready to come over. I left my job and I was doing a lot of fitness work. So when I did get there, I was in pretty good nick, but nothing like what I was expecting 
yeah, how my body was feeling was going to feel in a four day game compared to only ever playing two days, one every Saturday, you know. And sometimes you play the Saturday, Sunday, one day. But I mean, there's nothing like us for, for a young guy like to bowl 20 something overs day one, 96 overs in the park, get up next morning, have brekkie, get to the ground, back in your work again. Like it was just, it was a massive shock to the system. Um, and yeah, I mean, a huge challenge, huge challenge. Um, different country, um, no no immediate support network in the country. I've got family, aunties, and and obviously my family that were available, but I didn't really reach out at the start. I sort of just just tried to get involved in the game and get around the group and um, and just charge in and see what I could do. It was exciting. I, I remember getting my gear the first night, and this sounds silly, but you know I got my helmet. I put my helmet on. It's got the Firebirds logo. You know I was in the in the bathroom in my undies, and I had the Firebirds helmet on, and I had my training training jersey on and I was like taking photos dad look at this mate I got my own helmet you know like got my own bag that's, all about. that's not that's not that's not strange at all that's not strange at all I'll never forget when I got my first under 19 um Scottish helmet with it with just a thistle on it you've got your firebird new kit track suits weights helmet not strange at all you must have been buzzing at that point yeah it was amazing and like just going through all the stuff and unpacking it I was like a kid at Christmas you know I was just and I was really excited and, and um, it sort of, for me, it was the start of a new chapter, but the culmination of a lot of work in terms of a lot of overs. Um, but the real work was yet to come in terms of work on myself because I was still very naive. I was still, you know, battling with some, some anxiety issues and some alcohol issues, which still am to this day. So, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't the easiest route because I had left my support network. My partner at the time, she was, she stayed back in Brisbane. Um, we'd been together for quite a few years and she was studying so she stayed back and visit but it was it wasn't like an easy option it was like this is the hardest option I could make because I've got a chance to do it um, and you know thousands of other kids would give their right leg to play a first class match um, and I had the opportunity so I had to make the you know the appropriate sacrifices which as you know in this world mate you don't without the sacrifice you don't get the win so well, you went on to have Five seasons with the Firebirds. What was your kind of, what was your greatest achievements there? What what big? What are your biggest memories of, of playing at that level? Players you played against, some scalps that you had along the way. Tell me about it. Yeah, I mean it was fantastic. I mean my first wicket. So we we played a pre-season, a couple of pre-season matches in Mount Mungnui, against Northern Districts. Um, you know they've got the current players like Southie, Bolt, Wagner, the Grondholm. Seifert, at the time they had BJ Watling, Ish Sodi, you know, they just had the whole team, Kane Williamson, Dean Brownlee, Daniel Flynn, the whole team was like a, a test side, you know. Uh, Brent Tarnell was one of the open goals, he played you know, a handful of test, 10 test matches. Um, Graham Aldridge, who played test cricket, so everyone in their team had been a test cricketer. My team was a Ryder, Franklin, Patel, Gillespie, Mackay, all those guys who played test cricket and there was more. You know, perhaps these guys, are, and these guys I'll, I'll forget that'll get the shits, but it was like two test sides. And I've been watching these guys six months ago playing against the Aussies, playing against England in one day. And, you know, Howe, Sinclair, all these guys. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I actually had a pretty good couple of games in the preseason games and I got the nod. So we, we, we flew to uh, Nelson Park in, in Napier. And um, you wouldn't believe it, like, the morning of Jamie, Jamie didn't like telling you the night before. And I was rooming with the eventual 12th man, who's a good mate of mine. And um, it's pretty awkward when you get the nod in front of him on the morning and you know you got a room with him for four days and you got, he's got to carry you the drinks. But anyway, mum and dad were there and they had the caravan set up with my, my, my grandma on the end. And a couple of overs in, lefty Jeet Raval, who's played, you know, obviously up in the batting for New Zealand quite a fair bit. Um, our cordon was like Franklin Ryder. Anyway, so I nicked off Raval. Front foot Noe, caught Franklin. Front foot Noe, my first wicket. And you can imagine in that environment, it's like a cardinal sin, you know? So long story short, a uh, couple of overs later, nicked him off again and got my first pole. But yeah, so it was just, it was just funny how it leads up to, you know, you work so hard and you get your first wicket, your dad goes nuts. He's the only one watching, by the way. There's only him in the crowd. And it's a front foot Noe. And then all the guys are like, oh, this guy, he's a clubby. And then day, mate, honestly, day two, or the second innings, Ronky, I think Ronks was keeping. I think it was Ronks, or it might have been someone else at the time. They're keeping up to the stumps to me because I was just not used to being 
three, four days in the dirt, you know, and I was still, you know, probably bowling 120, but it was just, it was like, mate, you're bowling backwards. And then I, I think I bowled 20 something in the first dig and like eight in the second got cut. Ryder got a hundred in both innings, 180 in the second, not out. And we chased down 390 in a day. And I thought, how easy is this outright stuff in four days in first class cricket? Little did I know, mate. Little did I know. Yeah, so, you learn. You learn. You had to learn the hard way on the on the job. Obviously, when did you start yeah. to find that you were, you know, you start. You could call yourself. I'm a first class fast bowler now. You know, I know what I'm doing at this level. A few years because I mean I played a lot of T20 cricket. Um, didn't play much first class cricket, so I played probably you know. 11 or 12 games and a handful of one days. But my main forte was T20 cricket. I played you know, 35 or something T20 uh, games professionally. And so about 50 or up. But that was my that was my go. Um, you know, bowling in swingers, swinging the ball early and then obviously hit, hitting Yorkers at the desk. So I'd bowl one and two, one and three or three and four. Uh, sorry, one and three, two and four, one of those sets. Mm-hmm. And I'd bowl 18 and 20, every pretty much every T20 game I had. So there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Um, but until I was a, I mean, I never was really a uh, consistent first class player. I didn't have a season where I played every game. I played one or two here and then someone would come back and then I'd be 12th man or I'd be out of the squad. Then I'd one or two here. So it was a bit choppy changing for the first class stuff. So, you know, like I never really felt like I belonged. I still felt like I was a clubby from Lynham, you know, just, just, just scraping by. I never, I was always waiting for the phone call saying you're in. Even if I got five for the week before, I'm still waiting for that phone call. I remember the start of my fourth season. Um, I actually got a, I got a hat trick in ND's first innings. Um, Southie, Santana, Baker, I think it was, but it was over two oh, overs. So was, oh man, they were on 590. We've been in the, in the park for 160 overs. I was bowling my 34th over and I was completely knackered. And, and I think they were just going for a week. So um, it's actually a pretty funny story about how I got the LBW. I, the night before at the bar at the pub and um, having dinner, and I went across and had a chat to the umpire. He's a really good guy, um, and he was sitting on his own. So I decided to grab my pint and grab another pint for him, and have my dinner with him. And we just talked about everything in between cricket and everything else. And yeah, it was just great because you know um, we made a good connection, and we just sort of I left it and said good night. And the next day, you know, you're on, now you're on first name basis with the guy, and you can like, there you go. A long way from that kid who used to yell at umpies to bowl on front foot. No, if you learned, you me, learned show me uh, where, show me where my front foot was, mate. I don't believe you. Learn, you. you learn as you go along, don't you? That it's best to keep, uh, best to keep uh, on the right side of the umpires because they can make your, they can make your day a struggle. And um, what did you kind of finish with with your record then in New Zealand? You mentioned you were successful, so you played what thirty five T twenties, something like that. Yeah, so I, I think I uh, averaged sort of early twenties with the ball. Um, my, my, my record in, in first class cricket wasn't good, but I mean, for me, like I was just a battler. Um, I managed only 11 games, I think, but I, I'll take away a hat trick from that in the Fifa. So, you know, I have a funny joke with a friend of mine, Brent Tarnell, who's played a couple of hundred first class games, never got a hat trick. So I'll play 11, I'll, I'll take one. So that's that's a whole lot for me. And and um, we won the Georgie Pie Super Smash in 2017, I think it was, um, against Auckland in. in, uh, in uh, Hamilton, and that was the year that was the last year of the Champions Trophy. So, you know, we won it. We're on the plane, the Champions Trophy. It was great. I got the the honour of bowling the last over there and and closing out the game for the boys. Um, So that was fantastic. You know, it was going from where I'd come from to being on national television, bowling out, you know, the T20 KFC Big Bash, or I think it was Georgie Pie Super Smash, we called it over there. So it was was surreal. It was great. Um, And then, yeah, so... That was sort of where I, I fit in was the T20 stuff. You know, I felt comfortable there. Um, but yes, that, that sort of filtered out and then and then made my way across to Auckland for the last year and then um, got injured around Christmas time and, and came home. So when did you come home? What, what year would we, what year would we have been? 22, so probably about 18, 2018 now. Yeah, or probably 17, 2017. Yeah. Yeah. So and everything in my time was probably a year back. So it's about five, probably about five years ago, mate. Yeah, yeah. Did you pretty much call it at that day, Dan, or did you come back to Australia and, and keep playing some great cricket? No, I played some great cricket for Norse again. We won the first and second grade championship um, the year that I came back. And then I sort of pulled stumps. Um, the body was suffering a bit. You know, that there's a lot of times where, you know, first-class cricket, the environment's really, I, I found it to be really 
stressful for a, for a fast bowler if you're on the fringes and you're not re- – so I was never really committed to the fitness side of things. I never really gave it 100%. So I had to work harder to just to be at the par level with everyone else, I believe. I felt I had to work harder just to be on par with guys who were still – they were doing their own work and they were working hard. So do you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So um, – and my body took a hammering. I, I leave nothing on the park, you know, so I just – Give it everything every time, and and the body was. Would, you have, done, I had would a, you have done things? Would you have done things a bit different, Dino? You know, if you knew, you know, you know, it's the old saying: if you le- you, you learn as you go. But would you have done things different in your career if you if you knew what you know now? Oh, 100 percent. I think um, retrospect or you know perspective now on on looking back, you know, it's it's everyone's got that that sort of gut wrenching feeling about some situations you get into and whatever else, but. I think the key is, I don't want to be cliche about it. I think the key is that everyone's path is different. Um, everyone's got different things that make them tick. Everyone fits in in a different way. And none of it's right and none of it's wrong, I suppose. I think it's just what is. And I think society gets us a little bit mixed up and, and conditions us to think that this is right and this is wrong, you know, or this is the way things should be. Um, and as a group, as sporting people, I think we need to just go back to having fun and, and still being professional because the money you get paid now is ridiculous. So you've got to be professional. Um, but to answer your question, Shaky, yeah, I would I would have done a lot of things differently. Um, I would have probably behaved more more professionally like I was at work. It was a job. But for me, I was just, I felt so lucky, lucky to be there. So I was like, hands up, let's go, you know? So um, every any moment could be your last. That was my sort of take on it. But yeah, looking back, definitely. So you come to the end of your cricket playing career. Um, something you've mentioned quite a few times in the podcast, and I, and I want to touch on it in a bit more depth now, um, is alcohol. You're fond of a, you're fond of a, of a drink oh, yeah. or two. You know, you've mentioned it kind of from your young age all the way through, and you've also mentioned that it was probably caused you some problems along the way as well. How is alcohol? How, how has it affected your life? Oh, it's, you know, it's been a coping mechanism for me ever since I was a kid, you know. Um, it's probably the one of the sole um, reasons for a lot of the bad things that have have occurred or some of the regrettable things that have occurred. Um, and, and, some of the, and some of the decisions and mistakes I've made, I think, is directly related to not just drinking alcohol, but the after effects of it as well. So from a physical perspective and a mental perspective, you tend to not really cope with things as, as well if you're hungover or if you're anxious or whatever else. so like it's it's had a massive impact on my life and and you know it's something that's a, con- a constant work on um you know it's something that i'm learning to talk about it's one of those things where it's a bit taboo you know especially in in sporting circles you don't really want to be vulnerable and talk about stuff like that because you've got to try and um hold on to it like a hard shell a bit of a facade but you know i'm learning to talk about it now and i think it's 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 good to talk about it. So it's, yeah, it's had a massive impact um, over the last sort of 20 years of my life and something that I think, um, yeah, some regrettable things in there, definitely. And how are you, how are you, how, how's life now, Dino? You know, cricket, I've only, only known you, you know, as a guy who just, fun loving guy, turns out at the cricket ground, you would hear you before you'd see you. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and, you know, just, always having a laugh, having a giggle. Um, we mentioned, you know, I always felt sometimes you were, it's interesting to hear you talk about social anxiety quite a bit. Um, you know, I never really knew that about you. And at young ages, you don't talk about these things. You learn them in life. Yeah. Now you're able as a, a mature adult to talk about these things. But I can kind of understand it now because I always felt like you were always trying that bit too much. Um, you were just, in my eyes, were just a misunderstood lad. Anyone that knows you, um, knows you well, knows you had a really good heart and you were just a lovable kid that just loved his cricket. But, you know, you were going through a lot of life experiences at a young age that maybe, you know, it takes time to get used to these. You know, I, I'm not, I'll put my hands up, and say, you know, on my travels to South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, I made a few ma- few mistakes along the way. I, I I never had it similar to you, but I, was, I had a flat in New Zealand and it's safe to say I wasn't very good at, ha- like, cleaning at that point. And I'll never forget when I came back home um, the Northland Cricket Association contacted my mum and dad and said that I'd left the flat an absolute disgrace 
Uh, so my mum and dad had to pay for a cleaner. So, you know, I've, I, 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 and, it, and it got sorted out. And I remember I, 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 all through my life, I've thought back about that time and just thought, you know, that was terrible. I should have been, but it was just being away, being away from home. I just wasn't staying on top of things, young, 19, 20 years old. Um, and you live and you learn. Um, so you have different think, you have different priorities at that age, mate. I think than, uh, yeah. than cleaning the house or cleaning the oven, mate. You know, and exactly, some of us still don't exactly. do it. Exactly, but you, but now you should see me, Dino. Now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proper domestic goddess. I'm, I'm on it. You know, every day I'm cleaning. I stay on top of things. So maybe that experience taught me that you know you can't can't be like that. You need to you need to be you need to be better. Um, and and, and you know, listening to you today, it's just been warm my heart because. Uh, you know, I've always had love for you, lots of love for you. I know there's a lot of people in Scotland that maybe have a negative um, viewpoint on you. And I hope anybody that does have a negative viewpoint maybe watches this podcast and realises a little bit more about maybe what it was like coming over and we all make mistakes um, and you've clearly learned from them and you've reflected on them. I think you've spoken and really honestly about a lot of things. You aren't pointing the finger at anybody. You've taken ownership. Um and it's it's been it's been great to listen. But tell me about life now. What are you doing with yourself? Um and how and how's life going in general, just to come to the back end of the podcast. Yeah, mate. Um since cricket, I sort of I got involved um as an account manager for a, a large oil company for a couple of years there. So I fit into that. So I fit into that uh, that group there with them. And yeah, it was good. Um it was a lot of pressure similar to cricket. Um, but moving away from that, um, I recently moved away from Brizzy just an hour, an hour away from Brisbane and and doing a little bit of coaching, so going back to my roots. Um, I suppose the, the the reason why looking at coaching and, and and coaching sort of people between the ages of high performance cricketers between the ages of sixteen and, and nineteen that area there just to begin with, you know, because I want them to that in a similar situation to me um, in terms of ability at that age. I kind of want them to to avoid some of the, the roadblocks and and mistakes that I made. So it's not so much all about the cricket. Um, coaching it's it's more about the whole process you know understanding what this is like and understanding and not with any bias just giving them the raw facts from someone who's sort of been there on the fringes you know I've never really established so and I think that's valuable for these young guys to know because it, it's it is a, um, a particular sport that's wrapped in this I think a bit of an illusion of grandeur you know you, you, I'm going to be first class cricket and everything's going to be great it's like well hold on a minute <laughs> you know you can't be identified just being a first-class cricketer. You need to have other things too. So, yeah, so doing a bit of coaching, Shape, um, and, and yeah, loving man. it. Um, and just and following the young guys on the weekend now that I'm, I'm doing some coaching for and seeing them, you know, there's nothing like seeing them perform. So I haven't got any kids of my own at the moment. So, you know, it's nothing like, you know, I go, oh, hey, babe, the young fellow got 60 on the weekend, you beauty, you know? So it's, it's good. It's a different feeling and it's good. But um, I'm definitely – I'll play a bit of park cricket here and there with um, – some of the local tournaments, some of the uh, the Hindi boys and the Punjabi boys around here, uh, down in Brisbane as well. I've played as a ringer for them. They nice. uh, the going price is a twelve pack of Coronas and uh, and half a pizza at the end of play. So, no, it's good value. Yeah. Look, it's, it's brilliant to hear, Dano, that you're um, you're still involved in the game. I think you've got a lot to offer, um, young boys and girls out there when it comes to coaching and and and, and teaching them um, what it's like and what. The challenges they're going to face, and yes, sometimes you have to. You're able to pass on wisdom. I think you know some errors that we've made along the way that you can you can advise to try and avoid. Um, but that's what it's all about. And 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 I do. I, I can relate to you. I do coaching now as well. Still play a bit. Um, but it's a great feeling when you have that effect on a young boy or girl, and they go out and they achieve. It's it's a different type of buzz to when you maybe took five wickets or performed well. But it's it's equally just as much of a buzz and I, and I, and it's nice to hear that you're uh, you're having having that feeling with with coaching and hopefully you go on to to do something in your coaching world as well you've got lots lots to offer you always had a really nice i know you mentioned at the start you had a dodgy bowling action but as the years went on i mean you had a pretty much perfect bowling action if you ask me lovely high arm nice side on you know you bought, you were you were a proper bowler and it was a pleasure to play with you it's been a pleasure to chat through your story today Daniel. Um, it's been uh, been really, really good, really refreshing, inspiring to listen to you. And I just want to say thank you very much, mate. After all these years, it's always great. To Thanks, great to see you. To always happy to chat. Great to see you, mate. Always happy to chat. Love it. Thanks very much, Shaggy. You're welcome, mate.